Today was my first day really getting to know Chandra and I can clearly see why she's gotten to where she's gotten. She is super smart and knows a ton about the industry. So I think you're gonna like the episode. Uh, today we talked about her digital transformation through COVID that Revlon has gone through, what it's like to market mass brands versus luxury brands. And I actually, I personally learned a lot during that part of the episode. And then also how her perspective on marketing has changed since she's had a daughter. Um, so really think you're gonna like it. If you like the show, be a friend, tell a friend, subscribe. Also, as always, if you have any awesome guests that you think we should talk to, send them our way and we will do our best to go and get them. All right, thanks everybody, enjoy the show. Influencers, inspiration, and Instagram, Instagram, Instagram. This is Earned by Tribe Dynamics. Here's Connor Begley. Welcome to Earned. Uh, today, we're gonna learn from the general manager of Revlon, who has been on a rocket ship ride of a career over the last 15 years. Chandra Coleman Harris. Thanks for joining the show, Chandra. Thanks for having me. Well, I can tell you, I'm really excited. Your experience is one that most people will not have in their careers. You've worked at multiple, you know, of the biggest brands in the industry. Um, and I think actually, well, for those that don't know you, right? So Chandra got her MBA at the University of Michigan, then spent seven years at PNG, and which was a fairly legendary uh, kind of management training program there, went on to be the VP of Market Marketing at Frederick Fakai, then was a VP of US Marketing at Sally Hansen, Rimmel, um, and now is the GM of Revlon um, after being promoted from the SVP of Marketing. So you've got some pretty awesome experience here we're gonna draw on today. Thank you, thank you. No, it's been a, a long ride, uh, but it's been a lot of great experiences. So I'm, I'm happy to be here to talk to you about it. So talk to me, let's talk about digital transformation, right? So Revlon obviously, you know, has been a very kind of historically has been a very uh, mass distributed brand, right? That's who they are mm -hmm. as a company. Um, and obviously during COVID, you know, the nice part was a lot of those mass distribution points did stay open, but I also have to imagine that there was this big push to be kind of more digitally native. Did that happen? And if so, like, what was that transformation like? Can you kind of walk us through it? Yeah, for sure. It, it did happen. I mean, I think we saw across the board, no matter what industry you're in, um, that there were a lot of shifts that were happening during COVID. One of the main things just, you know, to start off that we saw was a lot of changes in consumer behavior, just as it uh, relates to the categories that were really spiking um, and kind of the behavior that she was having during this, this time of being at home, uh, not out as much as she's accustomed to. To, to being. And so we saw a lot more self-care. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of consumers were not going to salons, as you can imagine. Uh, so that had, first and foremost, uh, an impact on uh, just how we saw our various categories perform. So we saw that nails uh, was doing really well during that time. Consumers weren't going to nail salons. We saw hair color spike, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and, and as you can imagine. And then we also saw some of our beauty tools uh, really spike just as people were more involved in, in self-care, as I mentioned. So with that in mind, one of the first things we, that we did was really focus our attention more on those categories where we were seeing growth. Uh, when it came to digital, uh, you know, we, we had adapted a lot of our brand efforts to also be more in line with what consumer behavior was. So we wanted to adapt to the fact that she was at home, uh, that, you know, uh, when you think about social uh, influencers as well, as e-commerce, those were all, um, you know, channels that we were really focused on, on adjusting how we communicated with our consumers. Uh, so one of the things is, is much more relaxed from a communication standpoint. Mm -hmm. uh, we wanted to make sure that we were empathetic in our tone. Uh, you know, we were all working from home, so we were, you know, tapping into some of those things that, uh, you know, maybe we weren't doing before. So as you think about much more usage when it came to your iPhone and being on your phone and on devices in general. Um, so we, we started different types of content. Uh, really focusing in on themes that were tied to the fact that consumers were at home. Uh, we had a uh, different type of edutainment. So we know that consumers were looking for some type of excitement and entertainment in their in their daily lives. So we focused the conversation much more to, to that avenue. Um, we also did makeup challenges, hacks, 
Um, we had some of our ambassadors come come on board and do tutorials, um, just interactive type of communication. Um, and that was something that, you know, really worked well for us. Uh, and another point I'll make is that we didn't have as much access to content. And as you think about, you know, influencers and different people that were much more easy to tap into, it was it was a bit of a challenge. So we also had to be creative, uh, creative in pulling in employees, uh, really doing um, all types of things to, again, make sure that we were top of mind and a part of the conversation as consumers were yearning uh, to really have that that dialogue and, and, and interaction. Um, another interesting campaign that we did from an influencer pers perspective is a uh, hashtag, but it helps. Um, mm. And so that was really tapping into the fact that um, it was no secret that women weren't wearing cosmetics as much as they used to. You know, they weren't leaving their homes. And and uh, so a lot of times they just weren't necessarily wearing cosmetics like they used to. So this whole initiative was around you don't have to wear makeup, but it definitely helps to make you feel better uh, mm -hmm. because we know that that a lot of people were also kind of in a rut of this routine regimented type of, of life that we all had to adapt to. So uh, the answer to your question is yes. Uh, we have seen lots, lots and lots of shifts um, in how consumers are behaving. Um, and we've just tried to be nimble and quick to be a part of the conversation relevant uh, for what, what consumers are, are, you know, just their lives in general and how it's shifted and changed. Is it tough, you know, I, as you were talking, I was thinking about kind of how wide the kind of aperture is, right? Just how many different categories Revlon the brand plays in. And I know that's something that, you know, um, a lot of the independent brands, I think have the advantage of being able to say like, this is the very specific thing that we do. And like, this is mm -hmm. all we're gonna talk to. And obviously they expand over time, right? They, they add into different categories. Is that tough to navigate, right? Is that tough to kind of, you know, to exist in several different places as like several different kind of product lines? Sure. I mean, there are some advantages and then there's some challenges. I mean, I think one of the advantages is that you can offer much more thorough solutions for her beauty needs, right? Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. um, you can be top of mind from a brand perspective when it comes to multiple parts of her beauty regimen. Um, you know, also when you see different dynamics in the marketplace happening, it gives you a little bit more flexibility to ebb and flow what you're focusing on yeah. uh, based on those times. So if you think about like, you know, COVID, the whole conversation we were just having, if we didn't have a hair color segment or if we didn't have nails uh, to really pulse up during that time, uh, then we wouldn't have been as relevant for what consumers were needing. Um, you know, on the on the other side of the coin, yeah, it has its challenges because mm -hmm. you have to definitely be in tune uh, with what's happening in each of those categories. And there's so many dynamics that are not always consistent ac across the board. So there's definitely challenges, but I, I think for us, it, it's it's more so a benefit. And it's just uh, figuring out how we can uh, leverage the categories against each other, uh, again, to, to make sure or that from an added value perspective that we're getting the maximum uh, impact of all the categories we play in. Yeah, it's definitely nice to be able to flex. I think if you were pure play makeup, you had a really rough year. Um, right, right, yeah. right. Yeah. Um, well, so how do you, I mean, you talk a lot about consumer behavior, right? And I think mm -hmm. two things that I'm curious about. So one is, you know, how do you expect it to change moving forward, right? So now that... You know, and, and the problem is, right, it's not, Revlon isn't just a U.S. business, right? It has, you know, an international footprint and not every country is going to operate the same, right? Not everybody's getting right. the same kind of vaccination rates that the U.S. is getting. So how do you expect consumer behavior to change broadly? Like, what are you, you know, paying attention to? And then also, I'd be really curious to understand, like, what your process is for observing consumer behavior, right? What are the tools mm -hmm. that you use um, to better understand. Obviously, there's a bunch of them, including just general intuition, but um, we'd love to understand those two things. How do you expect things to change? And then what's your process for really thinking about kind of the consumer and how their how their behavior is changing? Yeah, sure. 
I mean, I think everyone's trying to predict uh, what's going to happen on the back end of COVID um, and, and trying to see what behaviors will stick, uh, yeah. because I think there will be some elements of just doing things at home more mm -hmm. uh, that will uh, sustain once we get to some point of normalcy, whatever that looks like. Um, but as, as far as trends and, and what we expect on the back end, I think self-expression is one that we expect to continue to really um, boom uh, post-COVID. Um, also, there's been a heavy emphasis on I uh, from a category mm. perspective. If you think about it, a lot of people have had to wear masks. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Uh, you got it. You got it. Yeah. A lot yeah. of people have had to wear masks. And so the only way to really emphasize uh, self-expression has been with, you know, eyeliner, shadows, mascara, brows. Um, and so we expect that that's going to stick and continue. Um, another thing has been multi-benefit products. So consumers are looking for, for products to do multiple things, uh, whether that be, you know, color for your shadows and your and your cheeks and your lips all at one time. Uh, they really want to get more out of their products. So we expect that to be a trend. Um, and then last but not least is long wear. Uh, so very uh, much so related to the point that you were just making around masks. Uh, think about the, the way in which it transfers uh, mm -hmm. or makeup can transfer onto the mask. And so, you know, long wear allows you to not have to worry um, about that transfer and being able to operate in your normal, you know, daily life without any concerns or, you know, any issues. And so those are some of the um, some of the things that we expect moving forward. Forward. Um, as far as like our process, there's several ways. Uh, some of it is, is, you know, mental and some of the, um, you know, just category trend data uh, mm -hmm, sources mm -hmm. that everyone has. So, of course, we're, we're really closely linked into those. Uh, we have offices around the, the globe. So we tap into some of that local intel uh, to really understand what's happening and what we anticipate to happen in the future. And then I think the third thing you mentioned is spot on, which is gut. Um, and, and so I think, you know, having a lot of people who have beauty experience allows you to also supplement some of that, uh, that, that data that you have just with intuition. And so it's a, it's a combination of factors. I think at the end of the day, what we want to make sure is that it's grounded in consumer insight, that we are, um, you know, testing and confirming, uh, our, our intuition. And that really does give us a lot more confidence on success for for where we decide to to focus and innovate yeah i mean it's i'll have conversations with people every once in a while i'm like i've got this great idea for you know cardboard boxes right and i've <laughs> i won't i won't bore the people on the podcast with it but long story short there are every household in america is getting like five to ten cardboard boxes a day cardboard boxes <laughs> used cardboard boxes are worth about a dollar to a dollar fifty per box there's no reason you couldn't go out, collect those from the houses, save money for the, you know, recycling companies. And like, and it, it works out to being like for a small town, three to $5 million worth of boxes a year, right? So like, there's a huge mm -hmm. opportunity there. And I tell people about like, where, do, why are you thinking about that? And I think that, you know, that's just as an entrepreneur, like that's what I'm thinking about all the time. And I think for you similarly, like you've been in the marketing industry, looking at consumers in the beauty focus for 15 years or more. And so, you know, that's just what you live and breathe and think. And, um, yeah, it's a, it's a much bigger element than people realize. Um, well, let's much, I, I, I totally agree with that. Not, yeah. not to cut you off. I was just going to say, you know, at the end of the day, we talk about all of these uh, reports uh, that give you some inkling and insight uh, and then talking to consumers. But at the end of the day, consumers only know what they know. Right. And so yeah, they don't yeah. know that they want something until it's an option uh, <laughs> uh, for them to have it. So that there's an there's an element of it that uh, of gut and intuition that always plays a part that you can't underestimate. For sure. So I and like I'm, your idea about boxes. <laughs> it's a big idea, I think, actually. Um, and on top of that, there's a cardboard shot at cardboard shortage globally too. So this is a huge problem. Ah. And it's environmentally an issue and blah blah blah. 
but uh, but we're not. <laughs> I want to, we want to talk about you today, um, and it's really interesting your notes about the mask thing, right? Because I hadn't really thought mm-hmm. about it. I think in my head, because I'm so ready to be done with this thing, I'm like, okay, yeah, you know, mask things over, but it's gonna be around for a while, particularly internationally. Um, and yeah, yeah, I, I'm curious to see when that'll wrap up. Like in the U.S., when will it just you won't be required to wear a mask inside. Or if you have like a vaccine card, you won't be required to. I don't know. We'll see. And and even if you're not required, what will consumers do? Uh, yeah. Will they There'll feel a, a bit more protection, you know, just to, to have it? So I think it'll definitely be a lot more evolved from where it was pre-COVID. Uh, whether it will become uh, a norm, as we see in some of like our Asian, um, you know, countries, uh, I, I don't know. Uh, but yeah. I definitely think that uh, it's something for top of mind for all of us uh, to kind of keep keep in our minds. Well, I remember kind of pre this whole thing, you know, I think in the U.S. people didn't really understand the mask thing in APAC. Mm-hmm. Like, why are people wearing masks all the time? Like, what's the deal? And it's like, well, they had gone through, they'd already gone through this once before, right? With right. I believe it was SARS or was it SARS, SARS that they went through? Yeah. 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 And so, you know, they all got really scared and then it just totally changed consumer behavior long term. And so, you know, I don't, I won't personally be somebody that wants to wear a mask, but I know that there's gonna be a lot of people that do. So, um, super interesting. Um, well, let's take, a, so. let's take a step back. I want people to get to know okay. you. So talk me through, <laughs> uh, I'd love to talk through kind of two, two periods, two points in your life, right? So one was you went back, you got your master's. Michigan is a fantastic university. My family's actually from Michigan. I'm oddly a Detroit oh, really? Lions. Yeah, I'm actually oddly a Detroit Lions fan. There's like six of us in the state of California. <laughs> um, so I'd love to know about that period. Like what made you decide to go back and get your MBA? Was it worth it? Would you recommend it to other people? And then after that, you went into PNG, which is fairly, mm-hmm. like I said earlier, legendary for their management program. And we actually talked to Ruben, who's the CEO at Kate Somerville, who was, you know, kind of cut his teeth at uh, PNG as well. Um, would love to hear about that time in your life also, right? Okay. What was that like? What was the experience like? What did you learn? What were the elements that they taught you? Um, so I'm kind of combining two things here, but would love to hear about those two, those two elements. Yeah, sure. Uh, let's start with uh, business school and going to Michigan. Uh, you know, I think for me, the, the first five years coming out of college, uh, I, I went to Spelman College in Atlanta, Georgia, and I knew I wanted to be in business, but I wasn't actually really sure exactly what. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I ended up coming out of college uh, and working five years in healthcare. Uh, doing finance and then sales, um, and great experience, great opportunity. Was good at it, uh, but bored out of my mind and, and knew <laughs> that it wasn't uh, it wasn't the path for me. So I really quickly uh, knew that I wanted to change paths and get into marketing. So that much I had I had you know pretty much figured out. Uh, but for me, going to business school was an opportunity to change gears. Um, And it was also an opportunity to do a little bit of exploration and figure out, you know, what are the categories and careers that are out there that are, you know, at my disposal. You kind of don't know what you don't know. Um, Mm -hmm. And so Mm -hmm. for me, it was an opportunity to really explore and see how I could better connect my personal interests with my professional one, uh, because I knew that, you know, I was going to be spending uh, a significant amount of time, uh, you know, developing my career. And so I wanted to personally have interest in it and drive in into yep. what I was doing. And so those were really passion points for me. So for me, that was the reason for doing so. Um, and, you know, for, for me, it was it was a great opportunity. I was able to that's how I found beauty. Um, mm-hmm. Actually, through that experience, I interned at Revlon. Uh, mm-hmm. So it's it's really remarkable to think about, you know, bringing a full circle. Exactly. Yeah. And, and now, you know, running the brand, you know, 15 plus years later. Um, yeah, that's got to be a you know, weird kind of surreal moment to go from intern it, to it running is. the whole brand. It is. It is. Well, you know, there were a lot of experiences between. Let's let's be honest. But uh, but the but the whole idea of kind of coming full circle is 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 really a great one. So for me, you know, it's how I found beauty. Um, it's how I uh, really shifted gears and got into marketing. And uh, overall, I think you asked the question, you know, would I recommend it or should other people consider it? I think it depends on what your objective is and what your goal is. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I think uh, from 
a uh, shifting gears and changing roles and, and careers. I think it's perfect um, yeah. and a great opportunity. Um, I think it depends on where you are in the phase of your life and whether you have the fortune of being able to take two years off, which I did, um, and really do that soul searching, which, you know, for me was a great opportunity, but not everyone does. Um, you know, I think it also is with the goal in mind, uh, is it is it going to build and expand on your skill sets in a way that uh, you can't get in other ways and uh, other places. And and so I think it's a very personal decision. Uh, but for me and all those reasons, I, I definitely found it worthwhile and would recommend if others find themselves in a similar uh, situation as, as I did that that they take that path. Yeah, that reset button is quite nice. I mean, I definitely I thought about going back to business school a few times. But it's like for me, I don't really need a reset, right? I started in software, I want to stay in software. I also can't walk away from Tribe, which is when I would have had to do it, um, which just would be not the right decision. I'm going through business school, unfortunately, right now, right? For uh, <laughs> unfortunately, it would be nice to do that before, but we went, you know, did it live. Uh, so yeah, yeah, that's that's super nice. Yeah. And I think the biggest thing, I mean, that that I would encourage others that are kind of thinking about this is uh, f don't be afraid to uh, try something new and to shift gears if it's not really your passion. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I think a lot of times people feel like, well, you know, it's what I've started. I might as well finish it. And um, I, I, I would encourage you, like, you know, you're, you're in this for the long haul. Uh, so if it's, if it's not something that you really, really want to do, try something different. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and, you know, don't, don't fear that the experience and the time that you've spent doing something else will be all for naught. Because in so many ways, I, I still leverage, obviously, that, that that finance experience. I still leverage that sales experience in, in my day-to-day -day now. And so mm -hmm. I wouldn't change anything. It wasn't the path I decided to take, but it definitely shaped and molded and, and allows me to draw upon those experiences still today. Yeah, no, 100%. Um, it's, yeah. It's tough to do that, though, right? Like, I mean... We, I did it in a different way where we, I was in a sales role and realized mm -hmm. that like, you know, the path from where I was, was going to go to like being a VP of sales. And I was like, mm, that's not what I want to do. Right. And so my version of the reset was, you know, traveling to Australia, lived out there with my girlfriend, who's now my wife for about seven months mm -hmm. and got to really think about what I wanted to do next. And that's when we started tribe. So, um, yeah, it's definitely a privilege to be able to do that, but um, Absolutely. I encourage it as well, for sure, for sure. Yeah, if you can envision where you want to work towards or who you want to be within the the you know uh, path that you've decided, then it's probably not the right thing. And mm -hmm. that was kind of where I where I found found myself is that I couldn't identify anybody that I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. um, and so, mm -hmm. it, in in that regard, it was a clear sign that it yeah. wasn't for me. Yeah, totally. Well, talk to me about, you uh, forgot about P&G. What was that like? I mean, that I was did. seven years of your career, right? It was a while. I was actually there for 11. Um, oh, okay. And so, wow. okay. yeah, so that Frederick Fakai experience is, oh, was also yeah. a part of P&G. Yes, um, yes, 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 yes. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. So I was there for 11 years, and, and I have to say it was, it was a wonder, wonderful experience for me. It mm -hmm. was... Um, uh, really coming out of business school was an opportunity. And the reason I decided to go was I knew that I wanted to be in beauty and, and make that shift, but I also wanted to be uh, a great marketer and to have that core uh, marketing discipline and the, you know, CPG uh, experience that I know and, and brand management experience that, you know, P&G developed. So I knew that um, for me, it was the, the best of both worlds where I could really become a great marketer, but also be in beauty. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it was, a, it, was a, it was a great experience. I got an opportunity to work on big brands, uh, on small brands on acquired brands, on challenging brands.
students, um, you know, across different categories. So I was in mass. I worked on luxury. Um, I worked uh, a bit of a stint in pro professional uh, with, mm-hmm, with Frederick mm-hmm. Fakai. So I think, it, you know, for me, it was an invaluable experience that, um, you know, it will always have a special place in my heart uh, because it really did lay the foundation for you know, how I think, how I approach problems, um, really having, you know, a a, a blueprint to really tap into in thinking about every problem I encounter. So for me, it was an, it was an amazing experience. Yeah. Was there, you know, were there any particular lessons about kind of management that you learned from there that you thought were interesting or that you've drawn with you as a leader, or was it mostly on the marketing side that you feel like you, you kind of gained the value from them? Well, I have to give them credit for my management experience because it's so, to date, it's the place that I spent the most of my time yeah, um, yeah. really, you know, becoming who who I am today. So I definitely, and even as I look back and think about the examples of managers that I had while I was there and who I really seek to emulate mm-hmm. as a leader, um, you know, I definitely credit um, the time I spent at PNG for having some amazingly smart uh, managers and leaders, uh, ones who were, um, you know, caring, uh, who um, respected uh, my point of view and everyone's point of view, which I think is, is really meaningful, um, who had vision, um, who were, um, you know, not afraid to take chances. Um, so, you know, I, I absolutely think that there are some that that a lot of who I am and how I view management and leadership was a direct uh, reflection of that time I spent in PG for sure. And then I think while you were there, you kind of took on digital marketing, which I don't know what digital marketing was in 2008, <laughs> but like it was very different. <laughs> I know. Like what? I mean, there's no Instagram. Facebook was like just getting started. Twitter was just getting started. I actually don't even know when Twitter got founded. It might have got founded like 2009. So like Twitter had just started. So it it was actually prior to 2008. But yeah, Twitter was was very new. Yeah. So what what did digital marketing look like then? And then what have you seen? Like what have you know what have been the the patterns that you've noticed considering you've kind of been in it for so long? Yeah. I mean, I think you hit it on the nail. Um, It was a lot simpler. Uh, So. So I would say a heavy focus on like email marketing, on, you know, traditional banner ads. Oh, Uh, good old banner ads. (laughs) Yeah, old banner ads, if you can remember those. Uh, That's hilarious. It was also, if you think about uh, just search, it was really all about keywords. Yeah. Uh, yeah, So that was the extent of They were simpler times back then. (laughs) <laughs> much simpler times. And we were just starting to think about, you know, like what the impact of this social media thing, you know, would be on consumer behavior. So Twitter had just started uh, not that long. I think Facebook had just kind of kicked off and then YouTube. Uh, yep, so yep, we were yep. also starting to think about how video uh, really played into the whole equation. So uh, much, much simpler for sure. I think the iPhone was probably like a year old. Uh, so that also <laughs> gives you perspective as you think now on how much access consumers have just through their iPhone, um, it was a lot different. And I think, you know, now as you think about the evolution of, of what that looks like today, you know, it's a lot more complex. Um, the consumer journey is uh, offline and online is, is so uh, blended uh, mm-hmm. that, you know, it really is truly an omni-channel solution that you have to figure out. And it's a lot more it's really about content being where she is, how she wants to consume it and tailored to her mindset in every way, shape and form. Right. So uh, and, and not to mention that as a result of all of these smartphones, 
Um, there is so much more access to other brands, to distractions, yeah. um, to so many other things that it's forced you to also think about much more snackable uh, content that can be consumed really quickly. You know, no one's looking at the long form videos. Um, so, you know, a lot has shifted. I mean, I would I would venture to say that it's almost night and day from from yeah. where it was in 2008 for sure. And I think the the thing you hit on there that's really interesting as well is this idea of distractions and other brands, right? Because now, mm -hmm. you know, if I wanted to create a brand, I can go to a private label manufacturer and come up with a logo and create a Shopify website and have a product up in, you know, three to six months. And that's, you know, obviously creates, like one of the things I've thought a lot about that I'd be curious to get your opinion on is like, if you were to think about, you know, brand building, probably up until, you know, kind of during the time that you were there and then up until, let's call it the last 10 to 15 years, you know, if I walked into a store and I had mm -hmm. a brand that was there and I had Revlon here and then some other brand I'd never heard of, it was very hard for me to get information on that product, right? Like right. other than if I talked to somebody, maybe they could give me a little information, but there really wasn't the, the ability to discover new brands is pretty, pretty hard, right? And so in a lot of ways, um, you know, the brand was like a signal of the quality, right? Like I know mm -hmm. if I buy this product from Sally Hansen, it's gonna be of at least this quality. And so like I can trust this brand and trust multiple products in this brand, whether it's mm -hmm. a nail brand product or this or that or the other thing. Um, but now, right, that's become a lot less uh, important, right? Because I can go into a store, I can Google it, I can watch a YouTube video, I can read the reviews on the, the retailer website. And so it makes these kind of larger brands um, it's a more challenging environment, right? So like, how do you as a, how do you as a bigger brand, like navigate that, right? And I talked about it a little bit earlier, but um, I'm trying to think of the, the actual question I have. Like, it just seems like such a big challenge as a big brand. Um, how do you continue to stay truly differentiated in each one of the categories that you're in? Like, what's that process look like? I think that's a question I have. Yeah, I mean, I think it's the age old uh, question that I think we're all trying to uh, figure out. And I think even where we started this conversation, thinking about mm -hmm. COVID, I think, you know, even um, the, the amount of time that people spend digitally has only increased significantly. Yep, yep, right. Yep. So, um, so yeah, it's definitely a challenge. I, I think that, uh, in many ways, the big brands have to, uh, figure out how to play that, that same game, uh, making yep. sure that you're investing in ratings and reviews, um, mm -hmm. that you're present, uh, where those other brands are present and when they're considering uh, and comparing products and that you are giving them a compelling reason uh, to buy with, you know, uh, signals of, of the same quality that you've always stood for. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that we have working in our advantage is a couple things. Um, but, you know, one I think is, uh, just the amount of support and, and delivering foot traffic. Um, yep, you know, yep. I think that's, and, and driving awareness. I think there is some benefit that bigger brands have relative to the, the smaller ones that you just have to capitalize on it in the right way to make mm -hmm. it, um, work for the you. The only um, way they can get discovered is digitally, right? So like in a lot correct. of ways, that's a big, uh, inhibitor, right? Like physical presence does matter, um, in a meaningful way. It, it does. And, and you have to figure out the fact that they're, we're still very accessible as you think about our distribution channels. Um, mm -hmm. So it's easy and you can't underscore the importance of that uh, experience that that experience that you have real time uh, with products um, uh, and, and so I think it's how do you really tap into that um, in a way that gives you a leg up on some of these other brands that aren't as easily accessible but still offer the same things that they do as well when it comes to customization personalization you know uh, uh, ratings and reviews um, great content above the fold you know I think it's that 
and. Um, yeah, so yeah. it really has raised the bar on how we have to connect in with consumers. But at the end of the day, what, um, you know, really driving them in store is where we have the advantage. Um, and, and once we do, making sure that the experience pays out um, and, and that you close the sale. And so it's, it's not an easy um, a, a equation at all, but it definitely gives us um, something to really tap into as an advantage uh, that we really have to capitalize on. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's a, it is a really, I mean, it's funny because you have all these digitally native brands that really grow off of direct to consumer and like, but to go really big, we have to go offline. And it's just like, it's flipped, but it's like, you it already have that, right? <laughs> so um, it's just a huge, huge lever. So talk to me, actually, we're talking about stores a little bit here. Um, yeah. So, you know, one of the things that I was told, and I don't, I won't say I have any data on this, so I don't know whether this is true or not true, but um, when we interviewed Sean Westfall, who's an investment banker, mm -hmm. he was saying mm -hmm. that the drug slash mass distribution channels are having a really tough time, right? And you talked about like you have other channels like self-care, at-home stuff, all of that stuff's doing really, really well, right? But obviously a portion of your distribution's on the mass side. Um, is that happening, number one, right? I don't know. And then two, is um, what do you think's causing that to have a hard time if it is? Like, um, so those are the two questions that I have. Um, and I'm coming from this from a total place of ignorance. I have no idea, just because I don't, I don't spend as much time looking at kind of retail specifically. Yeah, I mean, I think it varies category to category. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, I think since we're talking about beauty, um, you know, I would definitely say, and we talked about some of these dynamics uh, already as well, but the reality is that the lines are blurring uh, mm -hmm. between all the various channels, be it mass, prestige, um, you know, mastige, uh, consumers so like don't Cole, really. Sephora and Cole. Uh, yeah, and, and, and those Target that's what we like, mean by mastige. Yeah, yeah like the, 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 the lines are blurred, you know, yeah, like yeah. consumers don't view them in the same way that they used to. Um, so I, I, I think that, um, you know, that for sure is a challenge. Um, there's so many more brands at consumers' disposal, as we talked about. Uh, so really getting your uh, share of voice uh, amongst all of these uh, options and, and alternatives is, is a challenge, I think, for Maz. It's also um, an opportunity, and we talked mm -hmm. about that too, but I think it's fair. I think, you know, from an omni-channel perspective, offline is online, online is offline. Yeah. Uh, so all of those things are absolutely blurring. So the retail channels, uh, specifically, you know, mass are having to catch up to yeah. what it means to really provide the, the, the right tools to allow that on and off offline uh, interaction to happen seamlessly for the consumer. Um, so there's definitely uh, some continual growth that the retail channels are, are going through and will continue to go through to offset uh, some of those challenges. Um, but we do know that, um, you know, we expect post COVID and as we come on, as, as cities start to open up, as consumers kind of get back to their more normal lives, uh, that they are yearning uh, to get back in stores. And so the yep. expectation is that foot traffic will increase uh, as we reach here into the summer. And so as that happens, I think there's just a heightened amount of uh, sensitivity for retailers to be prepared uh, yeah, and yeah. to allow them to, um, one, find what they're looking for quickly. You know, I think that people will spend less time in stores than they typically have in the past just for fear of, you know, being around people and, and staying as safe as they can. So I think navigation is going to be a huge thing and in, in making sure that you can drive consumers to what they're looking for and find what they're looking for quickly with the right information. Um, and then, you know, I think the, the other piece is, um, you know, just making sure uh, that, um, you know, you're well stocked, that yep, uh, the yep. experience overall is, is a positive one, that they can, you know, easily look up ratings and reviews, those type of things. So, um, yes, I, it has been challenging, I think, for, for mass and uh, just as you consider the shifting behaviors. Mm -hmm, uh, but mm -hmm. I think there's an opportunity on the on the back end 
for us to really capitalize on the foot traffic and also the growth that we expect in cosmetics um, over the next few years. And, and hopefully, you know, we can encourage consumers to increase their consumption at mass uh, as we think about, you know, Revlon. That's definitely going to be my focus. Yeah. No, I mean, I've seen kind of changes. I mean, you can see like Walgreens is investing really heavily in beauty and kind of enhancing that experience. So there's, there's clearly an emphasis being put on those departments of which they were probably ignored, right, by the retailers for a long time. Like, you know, this is just, it works, it's great, just let it run, right? I think it mm -hmm. seems like they're investing in that, which it should be really good in terms of the payoff long term. Um, so I'd love to dive back into this kind of multi-category thing, because I don't think there's many people in the world that have had such a, a wide variety of experience when it comes to fragrance, hair care, you know, uh, makeup, skincare, right? The whole thing. Um, so for you, when you think about those categories, um, how do you think about marketing to those differently? Like what works in one that doesn't work in another? And then also, you know, just because this is, you know, uh, this is Tribe and it's an influencer and kind of digital media company, um, what have you found in terms of digital activations that seem to work well across those channels? Yeah, sure. Um, it definitely, definitely is different across channels. That's that's yep. ex uh, more than across categories. And I'm asking a big question here. <laughs> you are. It's okay. I'll I'll try to I'll, <laughs> I'll I'll try to approach it in in bite size uh, chunks here. Um, yeah. So you know, I definitely believe that the the differences that you see are more embedded in the channels than they are the categories. Okay. Um, okay. So it, and there's some differences in in categories too. But let's first talk the channels. So. Um, if you think about luxury versus mass as an example, um, yeah. you know, luxury is definitely um, one, it's an assisted sale. So mm -hmm. there's someone there that mm -hmm. can help mm -hmm. you find what you're looking for. Uh, you can ask questions, you can try things on. Um, so that in and of itself is a huge differentiator. Yeah. Um, when you think about the, the categories within that, I would say, uh, as a result of that, you don't have to uh, market as much about benefits um, mm. be because it is much more about the emotional connection that you're making with consumers. So I would say that it's definitely much more emotionally driven, mm -hmm. um, even more aspirational, uh, because there's obviously an aspirational element across all beauty, but I would say even more aspirational from a luxury perspective. Um, you know, there are very strict uh, luxury cues uh, mm -hmm. that you have to follow. Depending on the brand, there may be a fashion house uh, that you have to, uh, you know, partner with. That um, seems like which such makes... a tough relationship to like navigate. Like everyone that I talk to that does that <laughs> is like, like they have to get every asset approved. It's just like a whole, there's a lot, you get benefits from it, right? There's obviously- Yeah, you're borrowing equity. Sure. Yeah, but, correct, um, correct. Anyway, sorry, keep going. Yeah, no problem. No, but you're right. You're you're it 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 is a pain. So I will I will <laughs> <laughs> confirm what you're saying. Um, so it, it it definitely is challenging, and it and it introduces a dynamic that is unique that you know you will not have in any other aspect. So for sure, you know that's that's how I would um, categorize marketing and luxury. Um, mm -hmm. You compare that then to uh, mass. And yeah. because it's an unassisted sale, so most more you know what's often funny than is not, I've never heard that distinction. Not one time in my whole life. I'm oh, like, wow. I've been doing this for a while. <laughs> and like, it's the first time I've heard that. And it just makes so much sense, right? Like you have somebody there to talk about the benefits. So you don't need to plaster the packaging with benefits, right? Like right. the packaging right. is meant to appeal to an emotion and appeal to like, you know, how you want to be represented as an individual and blah, 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 blah. Um, exactly. it's just, I've never heard that distinction and never even thought about it. And it makes so much sense. Um, it makes such a difference though. It yeah, makes such yeah, a difference yeah, yeah. because you, you compare that then to the experience in mass where you usually don't have anyone there, uh, to help you find what you're looking for. So your packaging and your communication at the shelf have to work really, 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 really hard. Um, yeah. or offline, the communication has to work really, really hard for you. So I think, you know, the focus from a marketing standpoint is then being a lot more crisp and clear about what your benefit, uh, you know, delivery is 
is. Um, Mm -hmm. It's definitely, um, you know, just a different dynamic uh, than, of course, still aspirational, as we mentioned, but uh, just different in that regard. So then I think the, the second part of your question was then, what are some of the digital strategies yeah. Um, and, and, and thoughts as you think about both. Well, I think, you know, for, for luxury, if I think about fragrance, let's just take an example. Um, you know, it's definitely much more emotional. Um, and when it comes down to it, uh, it is about the smell, but it's really more about the lifestyle that mm-hmm, you mm-hmm. are trying to aspire to be. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that is much more as you think about how you bring that experience to life uh, digitally. You obviously cannot smell the juice um, <laughs> in a digital in a digital capacity, but how can you emulate that? either feeling or smell or sensorial um, overall effect uh, that uh, online is some of the things that make that category very interesting because you're really trying to evoke um, an association with consumers versus um, obviously being able to smell it directly. So I think that's a a really interesting one. Um, You know, when it comes to mass and then how your digital strategies to support that, uh, it is much more around, um, of course, being able to showcase shades. You know, that's a big piece of uh, what we work with within cosmetics. So tons of shades, being able to display and help guide her uh, or him on what's the right shade for them. Um, You know, being able to use education, you know, because there isn't anyone there to help you. Like, how can you leverage digital to really uh, inform and educate consumers on what's best for them uh, to really direct them to the right purchase so that it's not so much of a big trial and error. Um, And so, you know, I think there are many of these differences that factor into the the marketing strategy but specifically as you think about the digital approach i think it's first considering the 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 environment uh the ways in which consumers are interacting with the product and then trying to leverage digital in a way that closes the gap for those things that are um you know more difficult for consumers to tangibly um, grasp and to ultimately give them the nuggets of what they need to to purchase. Um, so it's a it's an interesting dynamic. It is a bit different across categories. Um, but if I if I had to say what's the biggest distinguisher for for me, I definitely would say um, that the channel is is a big deal. Yeah. No. Absolutely. And you wonder how that changes with kind of digital, right? Because digital. Yeah. Luxury, there's still so that unassisted assisted thing doesn't exist online, right? I guess doesn't it, it exist doesn't, anymore. Yeah, I mean, I guess you could fake it, right? You can do it. There are some people that do do it. I think that um, we've actually heard it come up in a couple of podcasts where it was like Ilya during COVID brought their whole field team in house to have digital touch points with consumers, and it's kind of doing that assisted sale that you're talking about. Um, so you're kind of replicating that experience online. Um, yeah, no, it's interesting. Yeah, we do that. We do that too. So as you think about, um, I, I talked about the shift we made to tutorials, um, to leveraging experts, uh, because essentially that's, that's all that, that makes the difference between an assisted and unassisted sale is someone who can credibly give you direction on what's best for you. And that can be, and is replicated digitally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, cool. So, two, one last question, and then we're gonna do a okay. fun kind of end of show question. <laughs> um, so, you mentioned in another interview that your marketing approach had changed after having two daughters, um, uh, and I'd love to hear about kind of what um, you know what it changed or like how it changed. I know that I had heard from another somebody else I really respect. She's like, yeah, you know having teenagers, not that your daughters are teenagers, but like having teenagers is awesome. (laughs) Yeah. Because Mm -hmm. you get this view into another world, right? You get to see what, you know, what another age group is experiencing. Yeah. I'd love to hear about how it's changed because of, uh, because of your daughters. 
Yeah, for sure. Um, we talked a little bit about how I wanted to find a category that I had personal interest in. And that was the original driver. Uh, and it was also dynamic. It was challenging. It was ever, ever changing. And, you know, just with the type of person I am, I love a challenge. Uh, so for me, that was um, that was one of the things that I initially was drawn towards uh, with the category. Fast forward, um, I now have two daughters, a nine-year-old and a six-year-old, and it definitely is more of a responsibility uh, mm -hmm. that I feel mm -hmm. about how I shape and mold what beauty stands for and how beauty is brought to life um, and making sure that they grow up feeling like they're, um, that their beauty is being represented in the way in which, you know, the, the beauty standards that are being uh, redefined uh, today, even versus what it looked like when I was a child. Um, and just being able to have a little bit of foresight around how that impacts you and your vision of yourself and then what you think is beautiful in general. And so I think, you know, for me, um, it's, it's, it's a responsibility to make sure that as they grow and evolve, that they see themselves as beautiful, as represented in, the, in what they see and uh, building uh, a sense of confidence around who they are and how they carry themselves and what, you know, and how they enter the world. And so I, I, when I said that in another um, interview, it was really around uh, the thought process now that I have is much more extensive um, and also incorporates them. You know, they're, they're mm -hmm, always mm -hmm. a part of my thoughts when I think about uh, how I bring beauty to life and wanting to make sure that um, they're proud uh, of, of who they are and how they present themselves to the world. 100%. I mean, if you were to think about kind of how the photoshopping era, right, of like these, you know, uh, unattainable bodies or, you know, whatever it is, like that changes people for a long time, mm -hmm. right? And like mm -hmm. you are you know, you're putting messaging out into the world that will shape how people grow up. And um, yeah, so that's really cool. All right, we've yeah. got one, one last question and I'm gonna kind okay. of put you on the spot here. Um, oh, good. So I hope I don't get you in any trouble, but your <laughs> husband is also a marketer. He is. Um, and a very senior marketer. Um, and uh, so I'm curious, who is better, you or your husband at marketing? Good one. So uh, I assume he's going to look at this at some point. Um, <laughs> so I will choose my answer wisely. Um, I will say it depends. It, it, okay. it really does depend. And I know that's the safe answer, but it's but it's also the truth. I, I think that we have di we have different strengths. I think on, on one hand, uh, if you were to ask, like, who is the, the best, like, uh, generalist and thinking about all of the pieces together and, you know, um, thinking about the, the, the future marketing plans. And, you know, it's probably why I'm a general manager and thinking about how holistically it all plays together. I would say I'm probably better at that. Yeah. Um, when it comes to just like big out of the box, like um, out there ideas that are may or may not be executable, um, <laughs> I would <was> say... <laughs> Just going to say that. Um, OK, maybe maybe he has a slight edge on me, but um, either way, it, 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 it serves I'm for really. He's got a tiny little edge over here. I'll give him that. You know, I, I mean, um, but but it definitely serves for great dinner conversations and challenges and someone to bounce things off of. So, you know, I, I think that he's a great marketer. I, I think he would say the same about me. So all in fun, I would say uh, yeah, we'll split the difference. <laughs> yeah, my wife, uh, one time we were trying to plan a trip for, um, I believe it was her mom's birthday or something. And they were having mm -hmm. a hard time coming up with like where to go. And I came up with a few ideas and they were, you know, like you said, a little out of the box, a little like, mm, should we do this? Should we not? I don't know. And my wife told me, she's like, I was like, yeah, you know, I was like, 
this sounds really bad, but I was like, I feel like I'm kind of good at this kind of stuff. Like, I don't know, like these <laughs> kinds of things. And uh, she laughed and she goes, yeah. She's like, I just don't think like what's reasonable stops you, right? Like you just don't stop at like reasonable. <laughs> so like, I'm like, I think that's a compliment. Like that I am it's not a constrained compliment. by what's reasonable. It's a, it's a compliment. I think, you know, the good thing is that you, you, you guys are together. So, you know, I think the, the mix of the two of you gets you to a great place, right? Yeah. Like you, you can have a great, great idea, but then you probably need a little bit of someone that's grounded and figuring out like, how do you actually bring that to life? Uh, so, you know, and then if you're too grounded, then you may not push the envelope enough. So, you know, I, I think somewhere in the middle is optimal, but uh, it's good to have someone that, that kind of pushes you uh towards what what's great so that's good to hear <laughs> i think balance is the key balance is the balance key. is the key um well shondra i really appreciate you taking out the time i learned a lot today um i love that assistant unassisted thing that was so cool and um and yeah and thanks so much for taking out the time i know people are going to really appreciate it i appreciate it and really nice meeting you and uh it's such a great podcast i'm i'm glad to just be able to be on here with you so thank you for that for sure all right bye shondra Take care. Bye. Hit subscribe now. Earned by Tribe Dynamics. Tribe Dynamics unlocks your social media influencer community. Our platform not only tracks and measures your best influencer relationships, but discovers new influencers to grow your business through earned media. Get started with a demo today at tribedynamics.com. Tribedynamics.com.